exemplified above all other things, Lord. May, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Good to be with you guys. Happy Sunday. It's good to worship not only through music together, but also through his word. And uh, his word is the meeting place with us and God. So it's, it's going to be a special time. Luke 9 is uh, where we're going to be. So turn in your Bibles if you would. Also, uh, that Fundamentals of the Faith class, Ryan's going to start. It's going to be it's going to be choice. So you want to be a part of that. Also, the Mercy Hill thing, there's two days. So we used to just do one day of helping them out. There's two days now. Monday, we're going down and we're helping them put the bags together and boxes together. Tuesday's the uh, the passing out of those bags and boxes. So if you can't do Tuesday, maybe you can do Monday. Great, great opportunity to serve the uh, the needy and um the, the poor and the homeless downtown Phoenix. And then also, just so you guys know, I, just, I always like to let you guys know how we who have been blessed are being a blessing to others. So we have a teacher who works for a Title I school in the Valley. And the class, basically these students can't afford to buy basic pay school supplies. So just yesterday, um, she vocalized the need for 30 kids. We went ahead and bought all their notebooks and pencils and stuff for the class. So we as a church did that. So thank you, church, for allowing us to do that, which... Also is an, also an opportunity for you to let me know if you hear of any needs going on right now. There shouldn't be a family going without food. There shouldn't be kids going without school supplies. Let us know how we who have been blessed can be a blessing. Amen? So let us know. So thank you, church, for allowing us to do that. So uh, Luke 9 is where we're going to be. So take out your notes. Take out your Bible. Um, so, you know, I was going to ask you guys about the highlights from the Democratic National Convention. What, what were the best parts for you? <laughs> exactly. It was kind of like the first service, the crickets. You could hear the crickets chirping out there, right? Um, but I will tell you that there was something that was said that just got played off and put away and everything else kind of buried it. It was when John Kasich came out and he said, maybe we can all meet somewhere in the middle when it comes to party politics. Oh. <gasps> Can you gasp like me right now? <gasps> how dare someone say something like that? How, dumb, how dare someone speak this v voice of unity, right? It's, if, if there's anything that needs to be espoused and built up, it's that, it's that you know, we need, sometimes need to put away partisan party politics and, and meet somewhere in the middle and compromise, right? But as soon as John Kasich said that, I go, it's going to be buried. Some people are going to forget about it, but I'm here to remind us of it. How dare we think we can compromise with each other. How dare we can live in a world of harmony and unity. Everyone boo right now. Boo. No. No, 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 no. If there's ever a time where, where we are more divided and we're more divisive, if there's ever a time we need to come together, it, it's now. It's now. It's, it's, it takes me back to high school. So you need to understand in high school, like for some reason I was always raised in an environment that was very accepting of all people. No matter where you were from, no matter, you know, what color your skin, no matter, we, I was born into a family that was accepting of all people. So in high school, which is where all the divisions start happening, remember the divisions on high school? You got the jocks, right? You got, you got that tribe, we're going to call them tribes, you got the tribe of jocks. And then you've got the, the preppies, right? The kids that are wearing eyes odd, and, you know, they got the swatch watches. You guys remember that, right? Like all the colors of Bennington, right? All that stuff. Um, so you got the preppies, you got the goths, you got the stoners. Everyone thought for some reason I was a stoner. I mean, even though my hair was down to here and I wore rock shirts, it's because I was born to a family where one of the characteristics are sunken eyes. I mean, come on, you guys. Everyone, every day I walk in the class, they're like, dude, are you stoned? Like, no, I was born with this. <laughs> but for some reason, like, the stoners always just thought I was a part of their tribe. You got the nerds, right? You got the guys that are just, like, full on, like, AP everything. Like, you know, and for me, I never was part of one tribe. I always was all over the place with my associations. What was really cool was that there would be some days where I'm hanging out with the stoners, right, and we're listening to, like, Metallica. And then there would be other days where I'm hanging out with another group, and we're listening to Whitney Houston. Now, you're probably thinking, what kind of group is that? But I'm just, just saying it for example. <laughs> like, whether it's Metallica or Whitney Houston, like, I found a place in both camps. You guys didn't know there's a Whitney Houston camp, did you? You didn't know there's a Metallica camp, did you? See, I was the guy 
who on Saturdays was organizing the Stoners versus Jocks football game. Now, let's just be honest. We know he's going to win every Saturday that game, but the Stoners just needed exercise. So I, was, I felt it was my calling to get the Stoners on the field to at least engage in some sort of physical activity. But I never, ever chose a tribe. I was always the guy that just got along with everybody, listened to all sorts of music. I mean, the country music thing, it took a little bit. But, you know, I got there eventually. But how does God want us to function in all the tribes that even as adults we've created? Because we're more tribal than ever. And if anything I know about the grace of God is that the grace of God that we say we believe is going to impact how we relate with one another. And how we relate with one another has to do with this topic that we're going to call tolerance. You guys ever heard that word tolerance? Here's the thing. We've heard the word. Many of us think we're tolerant people, but I would, I would challenge how tolerant we really think we are. Because there's really an old tolerance, new tolerance. As a matter of fact, write those words down in your notes. Old or new? Old and new. So there's old tolerance, new tolerance. I'm going to borrow some wisdom from one of my mentors, one of my favorite writers, D.A. Carson. He wrote a book called The Intolerance of Tolerance, which is a fascinating read. But Carson basically, and, and the reason we're talking about this is because how we engage people who are different from us is going to reflect a lot about what we know of the gospel. Would you, would you agree with that? Like how we relate with Jesus himself encourage variety. <laughs> if anything, Jesus himself engaged with people that were so different from him, what they believed, how they felt what life was about, yet he still loved them and engaged them. And so we need to understand this topic of tolerance. So tolerance, the old tolerance says this, that we have to accept the existence of differing views. Old tolerance, which is, is really a rare commodity these days, is the fact that we can live in a context where we realize differing views exist. Matter of fact, Voltaire. It's been a while since we talked about Voltaire. There's no Lewis today, so you're going to get some other people. Lewis is on vacation, I'm sorry. So we get Voltaire. Who hated Christianity? But we'll tolerate. We'll tolerate Voltaire, right? Here's what Voltaire said. I think what Voltaire says epitomizes the spirit of old tolerance. I may hate what you believe, but I will defend it to the death, your right to say it. Hear, hear what he's saying. I hate your position on this, but I'm going to defend your right. I'm going to defend it to the death, your right to say it. See, that's the old tolerance. It means that, you know what, I, I maybe don't agree with you, but I acknowledge that you hold to that position and, and you have the freedom of speech to say it. So tolerance is neither indifference nor acceptance. It means treating people with respect, even if we find their ideas difficult to endure. That is a rare commodity because what's come into the picture now is a new tolerance. What does the new tolerance tell us? It tells us this. Not only do you have to accept a view's existence, it adds that you better not say it's wrong either. So basically, they would say that all perspectives are equally valid. And the moment you criticize someone else's pers perspective, you're labeled a bigot. The new tolerance demands that we consider every opinion to be equally valid. And I'm going to tell you right now, which the new tolerance eliminates all the possibility of declaring something as wrong or sinful. You can make no objective, moral, ethical standard, right? Because now you're labeled a bigot. And if the only thing you're allowed to hate is intolerance as they define it, well, that's logically self-defeating. Because if you're intolerant towards the new tolerance, then you're, well, you figured it out. You get what I'm saying? So what we are, are challenged to embrace and why we're looking at Luke 9 today is when you experience the grace of God in a context where there's people that are going to believe different than you, what does the visible manifestation of the grace of God look like in your life when you encounter someone who believes different, acts different, 
votes different, listens to different music, dresses differently than you. Because we ought to be, and this is what we're called to be, is loving towards one another, towards our guests, towards our neighbors. And now we have this openness toward people who don't necessarily agree with us on every point. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are called to place understanding above accusation. We are called to put forbearance above fault finding. And we're called to put unity above uniformity. You know what I love is I love looking out at this crowd and going, we're all unique and different. Because if we're all like me, oh Lord, help us. And if we're all like Michael Grasso, oh Lord, help us. Right? Thank God we don't all like the same food. Thank God we all don't dress a lot like in my bulldog, guys like my bulldog shirt, and we all don't, you, some, some of you can't sport this. That's okay. But the fact that there's variety, there's, there's this kaleidoscope of humanity that, that even Jesus celebrated. He welcomed sinners, and he was so patient towards everyone who didn't agree with him. How many people didn't agree with Jesus? They're found on every page of the Bible. Perhaps, and we're going to finish with this, so just so you know what's coming at the end, God is a tolerant God. Perhaps he's the most tolerant being in the universe. And we have a lot to learn about this topic. Because unless we see, and this, and this is so just rudimentary, every human being we come in contact with is a person that is groping to understand life, is looking for truth. And if we're being a hindrance in their pursuit of life and the truth, Lord, help us. You and I are called to be helpers in people who were blind see. And if we're intolerant or we are adopting this new tolerance as our mantra and we're not building bridges but we're building barriers, God, help us. See, we need to break out of this tribalism, especially as the church. If anyone ought to be the most loving, gracious, compassionate people, it ought to be us. But I hear you, and I see you, and, I, and you know how I know what's going on out there? Social media. Social media is such a pulse on where our culture's at. And let me just tell you, social media is an amoral instrument. It is inherently not good or evil, but how we use it can lead to evil or it can lead to good i'm going to talk about that here in a bit if there's one thing that gets me agitated it's that so get get ready all right put your seatbelts on here we go luke 9 look at jesus the disciples the disciples last week were fighting about who's the greatest in the kingdom right like pride has in, it's just occupied their hearts they have no sense of humility Jesus puts a little child in front of him and says, unless you become like this child, you cannot inherit the kingdom, right? Unless you become childlike and stop being childish. Well, the pride theme continues because now John changes the subject. As if, if anyone's expecting Peter to change the subject, here's a unique instance where John does it. He changes the subject like, hey, I know we're talking about pride, and, uh, but I got another story, Jesus, verse 49. Look at this. John says to Jesus, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he does not follow along with us. Jesus says to him, Do not hinder him, for he who is not against you is for you. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. Amen? So, maybe John's embarrassed. Right, over what they've been fighting about, and he's trying to change the subject. You, you guys ever know anybody like that, right? So he changes the subject. He's like, hey, just so you know, we were out and about, and we saw a guy. So this is not rumor. This is not report. This is a firsthand eyewitness. We saw someone who was casting out demons in your name, Jesus, and we stood in the way to stop him. And Jesus says, don't stop him, because if he's not Against me, he's for me. See, like good soldiers, the disciples step up and feel like they need to protect their captain from their competitors. You've got a name and reputation that we are called to, and anyone who dares try to edge in on what you're doing, Jesus, we're going to be the first to. So I'm sure the disciples are looking for a pat on the back for stopping a guy doing ministry in Jesus' name, and instead they get a lesson on tolerance. 
First point. Jesus deals with tribal mentality. <laughs> you need to avoid tribal mentality. Because literally, John's like, we got a freelance exorcist on our hands. Uh, we've got a rogue guy. We've got a rogue disciple out there. Someone is non-franchised, non-ordained, non-approved by the church doing exorcisms in your name. Stop him. Sector 12, get him. Some dude has gone rogue in his ministry. And the disciples are ticked. Why? Because they say, he's not one of us. And if you're not one of us, you certainly can't be doing the Lord's work. If you're not part of our tribe, I mean, where did this guy get his training? Where did he go to school? Who are his mentors? Does he like C.S. Lewis? Is he left-leaning or right-leaning in his politics? I mean, we've got to scrutinize this guy's work before we even allow him to do anything in your name, Jesus. And Jesus stops, not just John, but the other disciples, with their narrow-minded, self-important thinking. Could it be that God can work outside your group? <laughs> Could it be that God has the ability to work outside your tribe? Could it be that the disciples who are in this position to do so much good because here they are with the most respected man in the land at the moment, they have opportunity after opportunity to show kindness and encouragement with every person they come in contact with because the kingdom of Jesus is being expanded. And they're not helping, but they're going to hinder that work. Can I just ask you, have, have sometimes, have we embraced mentalities where our attitudes are sometimes exclusive, clubbish, cliquish, narrow-minded? Has anyone ever been there before, or is it just me? Hi, my name's Scott, I've been cliquish at times. What are you guys supposed to say? Hi, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> Good. I've been enough of these, uh, you know, c you know uh, CA meetings, clickish anonymous. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Well, I appreciate you. See, how we treat one another in the church is as important as, as how we treat one another outside the church. Matter of fact, write down John 13. We're going to look at it later, but Jesus says, the world is going to know you're my disciples by your love for each other. This text deals specifically with, I think, a lot of in-house, in-church stuff, right? Someone's doing ministry in the name of Jesus, doing good things, right motive, right words, right actions. But yet we have a problem sometimes with, with other churches and what they're doing. But sometimes that mentality can just creep out into the world, too where we just become so clubbish, so cliquish, that we just discourage so many people with our narrow, exclusive spirit. It's a dangerous thing to assume that God approves of no other work but ours. When we get to a place where pride is fostered, I'm going to tell you what it leads to. It leads to pettiness. You tell me a church that's petty, I'm going to show you a church that's prideful. And pride will always lead us to exclusivity. Matter of fact, write that down. That's good. That's a, that's a Scott Morgan quote right there. Tweet that one out today. Social media for good, right? Pride always promotes exclusivity. Because pride says, you know what? I'm right, you're wrong. You need to get on board with my group. You need to get on board with my position. And you know what's happened to us as Christians in our culture? We have taken a posture where we lack love. We love the fight, but we're lacking love and grace and kindness. You see, believers that think their only group is the group God recognizes are going to be in a sh they're going to be in shock when they get to heaven. Don't you believe it? Like I had a seminary professor tell me, "Go, you're going to get to heaven. You're going to be surprised who's there and who's not there." I think there's going to be a section of heaven where we're all going to be like, oh, "You made it," <laughs> and that's going to be towards me, right? Like you're here. See, Jesus models humility. That welcomes and encourages variety. Write that word down in your notes. Variety. Variety. You know, the picture of love, Revelation where every, the, 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 the heaven is occupied with people from every race, every tongue, every nation, every people group, right? 
This is the, 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 the cornucopia of eternity that we have an opportunity to, to anticipate. So tribal mentality, two things you need to consider in this. Number one is we don't have exclusive ministry in Jesus' name, meaning we as Missio Dei Church. Now, I'm not saying there's anyone out there, but there may be someone saying, Missio Dei is the true church. Maybe we should call it that. Hey, you guys, guess where you're going to church? The true church, Right. The moment you say that, the moment you're just like denying all other work of, that God's doing in the world, God is working in the world outside of us, amen? We don't have exclusive ministry in Jesus' name. This is the mentality that the disciples are adopting, right? If you're not part of our group, you're not doing God's work. And that's a dangerous place to be, right? They tried to stop him. Why? End of verse 49. Here's why they tried to stop him. Because he wasn't one of us ouch that that stings because i tell you i've been narrow-minded and exclusive so many times where i have i have judged someone evil or wrong simply because they didn't agree with what i believe see ladies and gentlemen it's interesting that here's a group of guys who had just been fighting with each other over who was the greatest now they're resisting somebody else who's doing successful ministry I mean, think of the pride, right? So if you're not going to work for Christ in my way, then we're going to stop any work for Christ at all. Wow. He was not part of their group. He's not part of their clique. He's not part of their, their tribe. So therefore, let's shut him down. Now, don't misunderstand me, because I know there's someone out there. There's at least one person here saying, so you're just saying we're supposed to kind of embrace everybody and there's no need for dialogue about distinctions? I'm not saying that. There is a need for good and necessary distinctions to be made in life. Truths about Christ. Truths about the gospel, right? There are certain things that we can engage people with, and I'm not saying that there's not a need for those things, but it's how we approach those topics that's important. We cannot be tribal, meaning this, this pride as if we're, we're good and you're bad and we're missing out on so many opportunities. Because here's what, I, here's what tribalism does. It makes us crazy and lonely. Matter of fact, write those words down. Crazy, lonely. Someone's like, you've been watching me past couple weeks, haven't you? Crazy, lonely people. Why? Because the more tribal you become, the less your network of relationships become. Because the more you alienate people who disagree with you on any topic, and I'm going to tell you right now, tribalism feeds loneliness and depression and isolation. And the, and the, and the more tribal someone gets, the more vocal they become. Because it's a scream and it's a cry for community, but they've alienated themselves because you won't agree with them on every single point tribalism is dangerous the more tribal we become the more the self becomes idolized tribalism is is fueled by an idol of me and unless you agree with me you are cursed you know how george carlin great theologian of the of the 1970s you know how he, he says anyone who drives faster than you is an idiot and anyone who drives slower than you is a maniac. Right? Everybody around you is doing something wrong and you're the only right. Is that the, are you the guy in that one lane going, idiot, maniac, idiot, lunatic, idiot, moron? That's a lonely place to be. Can I get an amen from somebody? George Carlin. You gotta love the little George Carlin, Right? So the disciples weren't trying to stop error. They weren't trying to stop falsehood. They're trying to stop the work of God. They couldn't wrap their minds around somebody not part of their group doing God's work. How tribal have we become? Let me give you some great general tribal groups we've bought into. Number one, ethnic tribalism. Black, white tribe. How about this? Gender tribalism. Male, female. How about this one? Theological tribalism, reformed Arminian. How about this one? Generational tribalism, young, old. How about community tribalism, urban, suburban? How about tri class tribalism, rich, middle class, poor? 
How about this one? Political tribalism. Republican, Democrat. And as if those divisions aren't enough, we make smaller tribes out of those things. Because I stand before you as a white, male, reformed, independent person who likes sushi and long walks on the beach at sunset. And if you're not part of my camp, you be damned. Right? We take everything and become this little club where, let's be honest, you're the only member. You're the only member. And everyone outside your sphere of existence is wrong. And you know, the only criteria, don't miss this, the only criteria that really matters is what Jesus says. Are you for me or against me? If Jesus is glorified and lifted up and named, because this man, literally the disciples say, we saw him and he's doing it in your name. It wasn't like he was just some guy just doing it in the name of, you know, Buddha. Muhammad, if Muhammad was around, right? He's doing it in the name of Jesus. And Jesus says, if I am named, if I am lifted up, if I'm glorified, guess what? That's good. That's good. Let's, let's stop for a minute because we are to rejoice. In, concern number one I have for all of us is your desire to be correct or be right or be in relationship. That question alone is going to determine how many friends you have and, and are able to keep. And how many, Some of you are like, I'm pretty lonely right now. Well, guess what? You've alienated a lot of people because if your desire is to be right, you're going to lose relationship. But if you're going to be in relationship, you know what? There's going to be opportunities to talk about views and perspectives and beliefs, but there's not this inner bent to be right. Can I just say to you now that I am thankful that there's a God who would rather be in relationship with us than be right. If God led with being right, we'd all be crispy critters in hell. Can I get an amen on that one? Woo, we don't want to be there. But he said, I'm going to dwell among you. I'm going to be in relationship with you. Now, God is right. We know that because he's God, right? Truth, by his very nature, is exclusive. But we don't have to lead with this prideful, arrogant spirit where I've got to win every argument. You can win an argument and lose a relationship. And my question to you is, what is the value of that relationship? If you've won a battle but lost a relationship, good luck trying to introduce the gospel in future conversations. Amen, church? Second concern is this. Are we more concerned that people are with us or are we more concerned they're with Jesus? <laughs> right? Like, you can win them to your ideology, but if you haven't won them to Christ, that's, that's, a, that's a horrible place to be. Right? Notice their concern. Verse 49. They weren't with us. And I think Jesus, just in a loving way, says, but he's with me. Think outside of your tribe. Think outside of your little closed community because being with Jesus is the greatest influence you can have on any life. We tend to care so little about people's actual relationship with Christ and more about if they agree with us or disagree with us. And we need to reframe our thinking, church. I love what D.A. Carson said. I mentioned him earlier. Here he is again. Our own comfort, our bruised feelings, our reputations, our misunderstood motives. How many of you can identify with any of those points right there? All of these are insignificant in comparison with the advance and splendor of the gospel. Think about what Carson is saying, and I, it's right in line with what Jesus is saying. This has nothing to do with your position on any sort of topic like politics or vaccines or your thoughts on the coronavirus or QAnon, who is that, where are they located, you know, all this stuff. And if you're not familiar with that, well, that just means I'm just a little bit further ahead of you when it comes to the knowledge curve. But, but here, here it comes, right? Carson says it doesn't mean anything unless you are lifting up the name of Christ. How are you using your life and your conversations and your engagements with pointing people to the gospel? 
Because I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to go to my grave telling you this, that nothing is more important than the gospel. How are you leveraging opportunities to talk to people, people you disagree with, people you don't identify with, as an opportunity to showcase the gospel? Because here's an interesting combination. A gospel-first heart is going to be the heart that forgets self and exalts Christ. And gets excited about exalting Christ. Because you know what doesn't excite me? Winning you to my side of, you know, music or NFL or whatever. I may win you as a Cowboy fan, but if I lose you and I don't see you in eternity, what, what sort of battle have I won? True, right? Misery, right? It's misery. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying, church? See, it takes a lot of grace not to be petty takes a lot of grace to realize that there are going to be more people that probably don't like you than like you. But rather than pursuing to be like, how about you pursue to be respected? And you're only respected when you show respect. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Be ready to give an account of the hope that's in you, the gospel, when people ask you and you're going to do it with gentleness and respect. Many of us have squandered opportunities to share the gospel because of our tone, because of our demeanor, because of our lack of love or grace. Can anyone identify with that? That I look at the countless opportunities I've had to love people, and I just said, ahead, I just said you know what, there's going to be a lack of love now because I need to bludgeon somebody with the truth. No one gets to heaven by being bludgeoned with the truth. Can I get it? That's a Scott Morgan original right there. No one gets to heaven by being bludgeoned with your position on whatever topic you want to choose. Number two, we don't have exclusive monopoly on Jesus' power. This is, notice what's fueling the jealousy and the intolerance. The man that is unnamed, that's not part of their tribe, is having successful ministry when they have not had successful ministry for a little bit. Doesn't that hurt? When you're part of like the, the, the tribe Jesus and someone else is doing things more than you are, here's what Jesus says. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. Because the power of Jesus is not something to be monopolized by one tribe, one group. The power of Jesus works in ways that are oftentimes a mystery to us. Think about the time Moses, Numbers chapter 11. You want to go Old Testament? Here we go. Moses invited a group of elders to go into the tent because they were going to prophesy. And all of a sudden, they're in the tent and they're prophesying, and someone comes, runs in, and says, Moses, there's guys that are outside the tent and they're prophesying too. As if, you know, Moses is going to be like, How dare they? Verse 29, look what he says Are you jealous for my sake? What would it be like if the Lord's people were all prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them? See, Moses had this mentality like, it's not just our group. I wish for everyone to name the name of Christ to be powerful. John the Baptist, John chapter 3, notice the last famous phrase. He says, Jesus must increase while I must decrease. See, John adopted a mentality that he is willing to be sacrificed in order for Jesus to be lifted up. Like, this is not about self-promotion. This is not about self-importance. Even Jesus, you know, John says to his disciples, like, they're coming to him saying, John, he's having more successful ministry than you are. And John says, I am merely one of the attendants at the wedding. Jesus is the bridegroom. And the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Like, are you excited that the power of God is being manifested across the globe? Even when maybe, you've, perhaps this is a chance for us to go, why are we not experiencing the power of God in our lives? Maybe we've become prideful and petty. Would you, would you agree that might be an honest assessment of where we're at? Like when you go on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, whatever medium you use, you look at the church and how it's represented on there, and I'm going to tell you right now, nine times out of ten, I get irritated and agitated because there's not a gospel-first message. Now, here's what I'm not, don't hear me. I'm not making fun or punching at the grandmas because they're looking at their grandkids. 
You're like, you're heartless, Scott. My grandkids are half a world away. Like, I know they need to see your mug. But the tone and the manner in which we think we're engaging in people, I think is wrong. And we as Christians have an opportunity to leverage social media in a way that is gospel-focused, Jesus-centered, God-glorifying. How's that for a set of hyphenated words for you? Can I get an amen from somebody? You like that? Thank you. Cheryl, right? Thanks, Cheryl. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to, we're in a position to posture ourselves as engaging and welcoming conversation. Just today, I had an atheist like a post I put up a couple days ago. Now, I know there's probably two of you here that were friends on Facebook, and I, I wish there were more, because re- that's where I get my significance from and my <laughs> self-importance from. Um, I, I, my spiritual gifts, cynicism, sarcasm, have you guys detected that at all? All right, so, uh, but here's the thing. When I post, I don't post things that are like polarizing. Unless you think Monty Python is polarizing because then people are like, well, I don't get that kind of humor. Ah, whatever. But I'll post, qu- and you know what? I get atheists, like an atheist friend liked a post by a Christian writer that I posted a couple days ago. Because in that, in that quote, there is a kernel of truth that atheists could acknowledge is important. I've had gays and lesbians like posts. I've had Democrats and Republicans like posts. I know, these are crazy times we're living in. But when you position yourself as someone that's welcoming and inviting to conversation and you're not going to bludgeon people with your position and your views, I tell you, what, that's the place that God wants us to be. Can I give you, can I give you some verses? Uh, let me just, social media. It can be used for so much good, but yet it's being used just to continue to divide and destroy lives. Let me give you some verses. Like, you know, you're going, does God's word say stuff about this? Yes! 1 Timothy chapter 4. Actually, let's go Romans 14, 19. So then, let us pursue peace, or what makes for peace, and for mutual upbuilding. Here's a good question to ask. Is what I'm about to post making for peace and mutual upbuilding, encouragement? Or what am I going to post? Is it divisive? I'm not saying you shouldn't engage people, but perhaps social media is not the platform because it doesn't invite interaction. It's drive-by posting, right? Taking out victims right and left and not giving them a chance to respond in a healthy dialogue. Let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding, period, full stop. This is the word of God. How about 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7? Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Unfortunately, there's people in the church who call themselves Christians that peddle in silly myths. Stop! You're not doing anything to promote the gospel. You're promoting all sorts of conspiracy stuff, which maybe makes for a good Mel Gibson movie back in the day, but guess what? It doesn't do anything for time and eternity. How about 1 Timothy chapter 6? Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. What has been entrusted to you? The gospel. You've been given a message. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Would you agree that social media is filled with knowledge? 99.9% of it is garbage. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Whatever is being circulated or touted or or, uh, adhered to out there, you are to avoid it and hold to the only thing that is true knowledge, and that is somehow putting the gospel out there. Had enough? I didn't think so. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearer. There are things that we have posted that have further alienated any future conversation for the gospel. Good job. (laughs) Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. 
But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Hello, evidence, look around you. And their talk will spread like gangrene. Ooh! Enough? Not yet. One more. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Christ calls us to be peacemakers. Christ calls us to engage people who are groping for life and truth. Church, be different. Post your vacation pictures. Okay, that's fine. Make sure your grandkids in Iowa get to see mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa. But don't you dare turn social media into a platform to espouse your view, which I'm going to tell you right now, it's tenuous at best. Here's what I know is true. The gospel. Build bridges for the gospel. Be sober-minded. You know what being sober, biblically you are called to be sober-minded, meaning you are not to be detoured from things like the gospel, which ought to be of first importance. Gospel first. And if you don't believe me, believe the words of T'Challa from Black Panther. Wakanda forever! In times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find a way to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. And guess what? We are. And you know what that tribe's called? Human. You are human and you are relating to humans. No other tribe matters. Every person in that tribe has been created by God, stamped with the indelible image of God in their life, and worthy of dignity, value, and respect. Now, how do you build bridges with people instead of building barriers? Point number two, you have to adopt a team mentality. We're not tribal. We're not tribal. This team implies cooperation. Team implies that we are all branch offices of the same business, and when one branch prospers, we all prosper. <laughs> I'm not franchising. Don't, don't, that's not what we're saying. But in a sense, we are celebrating what God is doing beyond us. Amen? God is working. And so there's this spirit of cooperation. So notice, number one, Jesus' strong prohibition. Verse 50, the very first part, do not stop him. If there is a work going on in the name of Christ, do not hinder him. You may not like the manner in which they're doing ministry. You may not like the methodology. You may not like the person. But if it's done in the name of Jesus and miracles are happening, who are you to stop it? I love Paul, Philippians chapter 1. Write it down. Look at it this week. Paul, I love the spirit of Paul because here's what he says. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, right? Wrong motives, but they're doing the work of ministry. Some people do it with good motives. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. He's writing from prison. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So he says, there's some that do ministry for Jesus' wrong motives. There's some that do it right motives. But look at Paul's response. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Because you know what Paul says? I've given up on (laughs) self-promoting myself. I'm in prison, which I love Paul because he turns every prison into a pulpit. Amen. Every circumstance is an opportunity to share the gospel. His whole thing was whether I whether I I die or live, I want to be for Christ, right? To live is Christ, to die is gain. He says that just later on. But he says, here's what I do not want to squabble about. I'm not gonna. I, you know, I may call people out on their motives. He does that with Peter in Galatians, right? Peter's sh- shown to be this very exclusivistic man. But Paul says, whatever your motive is, if Christ is being proclaimed, that's what I rejoice in. When you post something and point people to Jesus, I rejoice in that. When you post something that's just going to stir further controversy because of ungrounded, unfounded facts that you think... 
I sit there and go, this is not doing anything good. We're to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Matthew chapter 10. Is your desire to hear that the gospel is being promoted? This excites the heart of God. This is the kind of stuff we can rejoice in. All this stuff, they're, they're important to talk about, but this is of supreme importance. Point number two, Jesus' sensible principle. <laughs> so there's Jesus. Jesus always breathes brief sense into the conversation, doesn't he? He says, whoever is not against me is for me. I love how Jesus just says, here it is. If you're not against me, you're for me. The rule is this, there's no neutrality in the war against evil. If you're on the side of Jesus, you're on the right side. And if you're not, we're going to help be a part of that moving process. You exist to help people move from blindness to sight. You exist to help people move from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beautiful light. Amen? You exist to help people move from death to life. So don't let differences, petty differences, interfere with the goal of building up God's kingdom. We are called to rigorous love and, and, and aggressive affection, and this is going to happen when we think about what God has said to us in John 13. The world will know you're my disciples by your love for each other. And when we accept one another in all of our variety and differences, the world takes notice because they said, we don't know a tribe like that. And then all of a sudden they realize that they can be a part of it too because it has nothing to do with being tribal. It has to be, do with being loved by God in Christ. Whew. How many times, can I just, can I treat this as a little bit of a confessional right now? Am I allowed to, how many times in my life I have won the argument but I have not shown love or grace or respect. And I, and I feel those moments where I have made it my goal to be right, but yet I have bludgeoned people with the truth. That whatever my theological persuasion may be, whatever my political position may be, I have yielded my convictions with loveless, blunt force trauma. And I'm going to tell you right now, no one gets to the kingdom holding a spiritual bandage on their head saying, I'm here because Scott argued me. Can I get an amen on that one? I am here because, boy, that guy debated me. No one is debated into the kingdom. You don't have to pit charity against orthodoxy. We can be orthodox and have beliefs and convictions, but we are called to do it in a spirit of love and respect. So instead of Lewis, today you're going to get Augustine. Boy, these words right here. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Ooh, that's good, isn't it? This ought to be the mantra of our lives. What's essential? I tell you right, right now, there's only one thing that's essential. Jesus. Now, you've heard me say, and maybe I wore my bulldog shirt for a reason today, bulldogmatic topics, the deity of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, salvation by grace alone, nothing else matters. That's gospel. Puppy dogmatic topics. All the other stuff. And then in the middle, just regular dogmatic. So there's bull dogmatic, dogmatic, puppy dogmatic. You know what? We need to get people to, to, to embrace Christ as Lord and Savior, right? Eternity is in the balance. But in all other things, there's going to be charity, but non-essentials, let's just show love. Let's just show love. Do you think Augustine's right? Some of you are like, that's good, taking pictures of it, saying, that's my next tattoo. Fits perfect right there on your forearm. So a couple weeks ago, there's a guy here at Sozo 
who I've grown to love and appreciate, fellow brother in Christ, holds the different theological beliefs than I do. <gasps> I still love him. He's sitting right here. I'm at the bar. In between us is a guy where Brian is. Brian, raise your hand. There's a guy sitting there who doesn't know Jesus. More, uh, this guy and I are talking, you know, he, they're talking with each other. And I just know, and I'm kind of listening to the conversation because a lot of cool spiritual conversations happen here during the week. This guy's talking to that guy. This guy has a father who's sick, who's going to die soon. And not only that weighing on him, but just all the stuff that's going on in our world, as we all know, there's just a lot weighing on this guy. So this guy over here is talking to him, and it was almost like non-verbally we're communicating with each other. We're going to tag team and love this guy with the name, in the name of Jesus. We disagree on topics. We don't see eye to eye on topics. But guess what? One thing we have for, for certain common, love for Christ. Almost like a spiritual relay, he passes the baton to me. He throws out this softball thing where he asks me a question that can connect with this guy's journey. And what do I do? I step in, and we talk about the gospel. And the guy that's sitting there who doesn't know Jesus, he's thinking, the wheels are turning, his, their, his eyes are welling up with tears. And he's having, a, he's having a moment where he's thinking about th what we're sharing with him. See, what I'm describing is exactly what just took place, right? There are two people who may not see eye to eye on every issue, but there's one thing we have in common with Jesus, and we want that guy who doesn't know Jesus to know Jesus. Because in the end, nothing else matters. Here's my question to you. Are you willing to posture yourself in your world where the gospel's first? Because if so, I'm going to tag team with you on that. But if you're going to make all these irreverent, silly myths and this little babble stuff your, your, your hobby horse, I can't participate with that. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? People are putting out, promoting things that do not matter in time and eternity. If you're gospel first, I'm with you. Let's love people into the kingdom. But if you're just going to go off and talk about things that don't matter in time and eternity, I'm out. I feel like Shark Tank. I'm out. If you're gospel first, I'm all in. Because here's what God shows us. He's an all-in God. God is the most tolerant being in the universe. Think about this, because what I am commanding, and, and I'm using those words deliberately, what I'm commanding you to do is anchored in the cross. The command to love all people is anchored in the cross of Christ. Think about the God who created the world. And the fact is that even today are there people who deliberately blaspheme him. There are people here today, this is again, God's world, he created this, He's given them life and breath, and yet they reject him. They turn against him. They choose to live their life without him. They disagree with him. Does he still permit them to live? Why? Because our God is a patient God and not willing for any to perish, but for them to have eternal life. Is it not God's kindness that has led men and women to repentance? Think about this. You are a part in this process. If God has been patient with you, how are you displaying patience with others? And if God has been kind to you, even when that point when the, in your life you hated him, you disagreed with him, you didn't see eye to eye with him, and now he's shown you his love, you now have an opportunity to point people to that. But also, too, God is even more glorified in a context where there are people who disagree with him. The love of God is, is more glorified in a context where there's people with different beliefs and different values at, rather than those who only hold to believing in him. Meaning, if you're in a conversation with somebody, the way you are able to display the love of God comes out more with those who disagree with you than those who gr agree with you. Think about that. That when you're in a context that I'm sure some of you would rather avoid because it's easier 
to hang out with your tribe. When you're in a situation and you show Christ-like love with somebody who blatantly disagrees with you, God is more glorified in that because the love is that much more apparent. Does that make sense? I went into C.S. Lewis territory. Even though I didn't quote Lewis, that's very Lewis-ish. God has you in amazing places. Don't squander the opportunities to be gospel first in your relationship. He's given you friends on Facebook. He's given you followers on Twitter. Don't ruin the opportunity you have to point people to Christ. Amen? I'm not saying other things are, are maybe are not important. I'm just saying what we have sacrificed is the minor for the major and the major for the minors. There's only one major, and that's the gospel. Invite people into the conversation. Think about how tolerant you really are. And surround yourself with people that are not like you so that you have an opportunity to share the love of Christ with them. And all God's people said, amen. I think I may have been easier on you than I was first service. Was I, Ryan? Look at Ryan back there. He's like, first service. No one's going to come back after first service. I'm just going to tell you that right now. So, you know, the question wasn't who am I going to make upset. The question is how many people am I going to make upset. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are things I believe in. These are things I'm going to fight for because the gospel is worth fighting for. Do you agree with that? All right, let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a beautiful day together to to worship you, to once again be in appreciation of how much you have loved us and how much you have done for us. I, I am grateful that you're a God who has demonstrated your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us. This is how you displayed love. To us who were once your enemies and now in Christ we've been made your friends. How <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. We love you, Father. Help us in our day-to-day walk. Help us in our day-to-day interactions with people to, to celebrate with those who are of the faith what God, you are doing in their lives. And we are gonna, we're going to applaud successful ministry and we're not going to be jealous of those who are doing good work in the name of Christ and and even with those who are outside the faith may we consider how we have positioned and posture ourselves may we be those peacemakers may we invite conversation may we just be the gracious and merciful and kind people that the gospel really demands of our lives Give us opportunities to share Jesus because nothing else matters. Thank you, Father, for this day. Give us wisdom for the journey. Remind us of the grace that has saved us. And we're going to bring you glory. Our desire is to bring you glory in all things we, we say and do. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray these things. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give his grace and peace forever and ever. Love you, church. Guys, have a great day, all right? See you soon. Bye-bye.